Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ Show. Today we have Ian Baker, and we are talking about his book, Tibetan Yoga, Principles and Practice. So Ian Baker, his initiative of the Buddhists as well as Taoist and Hindu Tantric lineages, and has uh, lived for more than 25 years in India and Nepal, where he studied and was some of the great luminaries of the Tibetan tr tr tradition, including um, the Dalai Lama. And he's the International Fellow of the Explorers Club and Royal Geographical Society. So welcome. What a privilege to have you here. Well, it's a great pleasure. Thank you. So I wanted to, um, one of the things that um, I enjoyed the most out of your book is um, I've done almost probably a three quarters of the practices and some little variation of Western forms of, of those practices that you mentioned. I don't really have a lot of historical context. And so it was very interesting reading your book to see the progression of these things, how they, how these tantric practices move from India and then into Nepal and kind of morphed and changed over time. It was just very interesting to see that. Mm -hmm. And then I've also, you know, I think with the, with other Westerners like myself, you you may take a weekend class where you learn some of these things, but you don't understand the progression or the integration of some of these practices into kind of a whole. So um, I'm hoping that we can achieve looking at those things from those lenses, just kind of a, how did we even get here? What is the practice? How did it come here? And um, how do they all fit together? To me at this point, they seem like little puzzle pieces that I don't even know, I didn't even know fit together. Uh -huh. Now that I know that they fit together, I'm so excited and I don't know what that means about someone's personal practice. So mm -hmm. I'm so excited. Um, yeah, good. Mm -hmm. yeah, so let's dig in. So first of all, this, I think the fundamental idea with a lot of these practices are they involve the body. There are a lot of practices that just like they're, you're kind of, they're not necessarily body oriented. So I wanted to talk to you about embodiment, which I feel like is something I intuitively know that I need, but I don't even know honestly what it is aside from reading definitions or hearing a couple of spiritual teachers. But since you've studied all these practices of habit, what's your sense of what embodiment means in embodied awakening? Yeah, so particularly in the context of, you know, this book and Tibetan yoga, which essentially could also have been called Tibetan tantric yoga, uh, because these are all coming from the tantric Buddhist tradition, which was really a, I would say, an evolution. Again, I'm sort of, I come a lot at this, my PhD is in history, so this is why I sort of took very much a historical approach to the material, because I think that something that is often we lose sight of in the West. I mean, many people are drawn to these practices, but sometimes we tend to kind of romanticize the pre-modern. We, we romanticize the, you know, the, the exotic. And as a result of that, sometimes we sort of lose the, the real meaning of it, which is about integrating it into our own everyday experience. Um, and that's in a certain sense what I think you're getting at with this idea of embodying it. So in other words, it's the opposite. If you look at what is the opposite of embodiment, it's kind of being dissociated uh, or it's being abstracted or cerebral. So all these practices, as you say, were part of the Tibetan, or let's say part of the Buddhist tantric tradition, which was a kind of revalorization of the body as the vehicle for enlightenment. So we tend to think sometimes of spiritual practice is all about the mind and the spirit. Mm. But in a certain sense, what we look at with these embodied practices with, you know, physical yoga, hatha yoga, which certainly, um, which we'll, we'll talk about in the context of this, it's really about how we use the body as a way of accessing these deeper states of consciousness, which are in many cases kind of somatic states of awareness. They're not, in other words, they're in the body. They're not abstract. They're not things that we, um, you know, have to kind of leave our bodies behind. And we have that historical split, of course, uh, in the West, this idea of the body and the spirit. And I think what's the beautiful thing about, you know, the Tibetan tantric Buddhist tradition is it's really about the, these were never split. These are mm -hmm. integrated body and mind are a single entity. And if we try to separate them in some way, we're, we're losing that sedate of, uh, 
that sense of wholeness, that sense of integration. Mm. So I'd say that's that's the basic sense that I would refer to here as as what Im, embodiment uh, means in the context of these practices. Yeah, because a lot of these practices involve, like you said, your body being involved. It's not as if, and I and I only mention that because I've I've seen several practices and and I think some of these you know angelic practices where it's like, oh angel, please help me, and there's this you know or third party entity outside of myself that I'm praying to versus mm -hmm. a practice where it's like actually the God or goddesses are within myself. And it's, if I access that I'm access, accessing something internal in my body and I can feel it and I can experience it. And it's me, not something outside of myself. Um, and why do you think that's important? If you, if you think of something as external to yourself and it's dissociated, as you described it, or cerebral, so it's like it's all about my mind and I need to get my mind, you know, concentrated and focused. And, and those things are important. But if you don't include the body, what do you think happens as a result? Well, I think we become really disconnected from, from who we are and what we are, because we are not just minds, we're embodied minds. And in that sense, I think the kind of what often is referred to as, you know, in the West, we call it now spiritual bypassing, mm. you know, which is trying to take this kind of shortcut. Well, I can deal with all these problems in my life if I can just go into a state of meditation and, you know, dissociate myself from all my thoughts, my emotions, all my feelings. Um, and this is, yeah, I, th I think spiritual bypassing is 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 not an inaccurate word, mm -hmm. and that it has all kinds of problems with it. Because in a certain sense, it's about just it's not that state of deeper integration that we need, not just with our own bodies, um, but also with you know the larger body of our you know our community, uh, the ecosystem, nature as a whole. It's really about how we are to reconnect. Mm. And in a certain sense, you know, we, we see that as a whole in society, you know, today and just the whole trajectory of our kind of modern tech, technological world and, you know, the whole you know, climate crisis, all of this is partly brought about from just being disconnected from, you could, you know, could say the elements uh, that are basically within us and they're around us and, and they're, um, you know, by losing sight of our interconnectedness with everything, with all of life, we tend to think of, you know, spiritual development is just an escape. It just becomes a form of escapism. And I think that to me just seems a lesser form of spirituality. But, you know, it's built into some of our ideas, you know, the kind of corrupted forms of, 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 of how we imagine what Christianity was about, although it was not that originally, mm -hmm. but just think that, oh, it doesn't matter what we do now, because there's something better that will happen later if we can just kind of disconnect from the body. Mm -hmm. um, that I think is, uh, it's not the, the mystical view, it's not the deeper spiritual view um, uh, of Christianity either, but I think what um, you know, Tantra Buddhism, in particular Tibetan Buddhism, has preserved a deeper sense of that sense of the divine as something that is not elsewhere. It's something that's uh, the deepest part of ourselves. So to, you know, to go back to your, you know, you were talking about sort of angels and petitioning angels. And, you know, we, one of the, you know, the beautiful things about um, Tibetan Buddhism is this very, very rich art forms, all these wild tantric deities and these are never understood as kind of external gods they're things that actually we identify with they're kind of uh, artistic representations of our deeper capacities and so well, you know in terms of the yogas um they often start out with what's called laginaljur in tibetan which means literally deity yoga where why you you systematically take on the attributes of of these um dancing buddhas basically and the wisdom and compassion and the state of integration that they represent um and that's really i think the beauty of the tradition is that they are representing just in a very gra often very graphic form uh this integration of sensuality and spirituality and that's something that in the west i think we t have tended to um to lose sight of that these two are not uh, polar opposites. They're actually things that we need to bring together in our mm. lives.
Interesting. So I love that definition of embodiment. And, you know, in some ways, it's le- I'm, I, I was thinking about the term spiritual bypassing. In a lot of ways, it's human bypassing, right? Like you're not even here on Earth. You're not, you're bypassing the whole human experience. Yes. I have been, um, I've had various practices that I started off initially mm-hmm. doing that until I, I thought, well, why am I here on Earth? If I'm so... Yeah be in this alleged heaven you know uh, uh, and that this no has no relationship to this earth and i'm just taking a fast train to get the heck out of here yeah. what, what is the logic behind <laughs> why would i be born on earth if there really is no reason to be here and i've always kind of when I, when other people have those practices of like mm-hmm. becoming an angel angel or whatever god or, so that you can escape and go to the next realm it's like why not be yeah. <laughs> yeah, they are kind of losing an opportunity right now to 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 use this human embodiment uh, as an opportunity to to explore uh, what this dimension offers us. And I think exactly as you say, when spirituality just becomes a way of, in a certain sense, negating everything that, uh, in a way, we have before us. And I think this was really an evolutionary and historical shift in um, Buddhism itself. Uh, with the introduction, let's say from the sixth century. I mean, if we know Buddhism goes back 2,500 years, but it evolved, um, you know, from its earlier kind of renunciatory ideal to the ideal of the Bodhisattva, this idea that it, liberation is not just for ourselves, it's uh, for, uh, for all beings. And this was where compassion and loving kindness became really emphasized in the practice rather than just kind of a meditative, um, renunciation of life, which could never be fully satisfying. Mm-hmm. And then Tantra sort of took that, the Tantric Buddhism, what's called the Vajrayana, or the diamond vehicle, sort of took that to the next stage. Well, if we're here for the long haul until all beings are liberated, then, you know, we might as well, it really became a path of integration at that point. Mm-hmm. And that's why you see, you know, such a difference in early Buddhist art from, let's say, the Tantric buddhist art that you see in tibet for example suddenly you see these sort of eroticized buddhas that are dancing and as you know in coupled form and it's often quite jarring for anyone who doesn't really know what lies behind that right but i think in that in that deepest sense it is this integration you know of of you know the the sensory the sensual experience with the spiritual and in that sense it's a not just a human journey it's a kind of bringing the sacred into the human experience so things that would often be seen in a conventional way as somehow um opposite of the spiritual life become actually primary and uh, are transformed through by t- uh, by bringing this vision of wisdom and compassion into our everyday experience and into our most intimate relationships yeah yeah, I mean, that's, it's a different path towards growth, right? It's about mm. how you interrelate with your friends, family, people outside of, you know, in, in our community. It's a different way of learning and growing. It's I'm here on earth and I'm learning and I'm using the presence of where I am right now to learn and grow versus being in a cave in a monastic life in which I'm growing in a different way, right? You could, I'm sure you, I'm sure there's a different type of growth that happens, but it's just a different method, it seems. Yeah. Yeah, Okay. I love it. So we've been talking to Ian Baker about his book, uh, Tibetan yoga principles and practices um, about embodiment. And in the, the next section, I wanted to talk about something that we talked about in this seg- segment, which is um, being connected to the world around us, specifically the elements and what that may look like. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.